Hello everybody, welcome to the first edition of Cup of Joe with Jesus. You're probably wondering why the name of Cup of Joe Jesus and why is it on a Wednesday? Well, I'm going to start with why on a Wednesday. Well, I like to call it our midweek breakthrough. In other words, it's a great reminder because it seems that many people, they only go to church uh, on Sundays and then they seem to forget about Jesus throughout the week. So, being on a Wednesday, it's in the middle of the week, it kind of breaks it up for us and we kind of get a little bit of a reminder in there and to keep going. Um, the name of the Cup of Joe Jesus came to me a couple years ago actually for a book title. And it came to me while I was talking to Jesus and drinking my coffee. So right now, that's what you need to do too, is you need to go and get yourself a cup of Joe and get your Bible. And then come in, have a seat, and join us for a cup of joe with Jesus. So if you're ready to get started, let's start by bowing our heads in prayer, please. Blessed Lord, you are the King of heaven and earth. All of heaven sings of your glory. You do wonders on earth and in heaven. We see the work of your hands as we gather and worship today. Accept our prayers in Jesus' name. Do not forsake us as we strive to live our lives in honor of you. We have gathered here for our first episode of Cup of Joe with Jesus. Come down and allow us to feel your presence. As we continue today's fellowship, we want to feel your great power and light. Let us encounter you in a new way and bless us in our lives. May we find everlasting joy through you. In Jesus' name, amen. Alright, <clears throat> let's get started with the little story. Uh, this one's about a Texas cowboy. He appeared before St. Peter at the pearly gates. Have you ever done anything of particular merit, St. Peter asked? Well, I can think of one thing the cowboy offered. Once on a trip to the Black Hills in South Dakota, I came upon a, a gang of bikers who were threatening a young woman. Elijah directed them to leave her alone, but they wouldn't listen. So I approached the largest and most heavily tattooed biker. I smacked him in the face. I kicked his bike over, ripped out his nose ring, and threw it on the ground. I yelled, now back off, or I'll kick the heck out of all of you. Whoa, St. Peter was impressed. He asked, when did this happen? So the cowboy answered, just a couple minutes ago. All right, so let's get out our Bibles, or if you use your cell phone, Today we're going to discuss stormy weather. It's in the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. When I was growing up, I loved watching uh, scary movies, the horror movies. They were amazing. I loved them. But my style of scary movies was more like watching like Nightmare on Elm Street, Leprechaun, Child's Play. So you're wondering why am I talking about scary movies, horror movies? Because it kind of feels like we're living in a strange type of horror movie right now. And I'm not going to try to paint a bad picture for you, uh, but we are in scary and uncertain times. We really, really don't know what tomorrow will bring or what the next bit of news is going to look like. Yet the Bible tells us, do not fear. But for some of us, we feel like we're living in fear. Fear of going to the grocery store. Fear when we cough or sneeze. Fear of opening our mail. There's a state of fear all around us. The Bible says, do not fear. It means we are not to allow anxiety or worry. We're not supposed to allow them to rule our lives or take root in our hearts. We are not to be people of panic. We are to be people of faith. When we look in Romans 8.1, Paul tells us, uh, we've been justified by God that we are no longer condemned. We trust that we were chosen by God before the creation of anything. So we shouldn't fear his rejection. We know with Christ as our shepherd, we need not fear the valley of the shadow of death. And in Psalms 121 it says, The psalmist tells us God is the maker of heaven and earth, watching over us. So we need not fear anything. We don't want to be afraid, we want peace. We want that peace from God which surpasses all understanding. And we want that peace to guard our hearts and our minds. Peace seems so passive, Yet, it's an extremely powerful word. 
and the, yes, we are, here we are, and there, many of us are struggling with fear and anxiety. So, <clears throat> I want to share a story with you about some guys who were totally scared and freaked out about something that was happening in their lives. We're going to be looking at a story from the Gospel of Mark. In chapter 4, Jesus and the disciples had been tremendously busy doing ministry. Mark 4.1 starts out by telling us, Again, Jesus began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. See, the crowds were huge. There were so many people, it was easier for Jesus to teach from a boat. There was no rest until finally late in the day, Jesus gave the disciples an offer they couldn't refuse. So now we'll take a listen to what happened in four, chapter 4, 35 through 41. Now before I start, I'm just going to give you an explanation of how to make the Bible more interesting. you got to use your imagination and try to picture the story as it's being told. If you just read it, it's, it's kind of boring and bland, but imagine that. Like, you know, uh, as they describe it, try to picture it. Use, I know you've seen movies or you've seen images of Jesus. You know what he looks like. Imagine him being there. And imagine his voice. It just it's, uh, He has such a soft voice. and uh, It's just amazing. Imagine the power. Um, so just remember, when you're reading the Bible or you're even in the church and you're listening about the Bible, or we're right here at Cup of Joe with Jesus, use your imagination. Here we go, we're going to do uh, 4, 35 through 41. And like I said, use your imagination now. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep in, on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care what, that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? It was the end of a busy day, and Jesus said to the disciples, Let's go to the other side. We can relax, eat, and hang out. It sounds like a great plan, so let's look at what really happened. <clears throat> the key to understanding this story lies in one important question. Whose idea was it to get in the boat in the first place? Okay, <clears throat> The answer is very plain. At the end of a busy day, a day where they spent hours ministering to the needs of people, after giving and giving, it was Jesus who said, Let's go across to the other side. I'm sure the weary and tired disciples were thrilled at the offer. The crowds were growing with each passing day. Everywhere they went, there was a crowd. They came to, to listen, to learn, and to find healing from the Master. Day after day, they came wanting to hear desperately, and then they wanted to be near Jesus. Several of the disciples were fishermen who intimately knew the Sea of Galilee. And that night, the skies promised smooth sailing from the west to the east. They had made that journey many times in their boats, and they looked forward to some R&R. &R. It started out great. As the boat left the western shore, the lake was so calm, Jesus decided to go to sleep in the stern, resting on a cushion. It's not unusual for storms to suddenly emerge on the Sea of Galilee. All was calm one minute, and before they knew it, they were engulfed in a storm. The winds picked up, the clouds gathered, and the waves were crushing the boat, and water was filling it. As the water entered, the disciples furiously tried to bail, bail out, but the water rushed in faster than they could bail it out. The boat bobbed up and down as wave after wave crashed into it. Nothing can be more terrifying than to be on a boat in the blackness of night as it takes on water and slowly begins to sink. And remember, these were fishermen too. Finally, the disciples woke Jesus up asking him a question that we've all asked in times of desperation. In their fear, they cried out, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? Literally, the disciples were asking, Lord, don't you care that we are about to be utterly destroyed? We are about to be killed in this storm? It's not different from the questions that we ask the Lord when we're feeling that way. We've been down that road before. We all have. And we've all asked these kind of questions like, 
Lord Jesus, don't you care that my child is sick? Lord Jesus, don't you care that my marriage is falling apart? Lord Jesus, don't you care that my friends have deserted me? Lord Jesus, don't you care that I have no money? Lord Jesus, don't you care that I feel so alone? Lord Jesus, don't you care that I want to give up? Lord Jesus, don't you care that my spouse died? Lord Jesus, don't you care that I lost my job? Lord, don't you care about this coronavirus? Lord, just say the word and I believe it will be gone. And finally, sometimes we're simply crying out, Hello, anybody home? We feel like our questions and prayers are just not being answered. We've asked that question in a million ways, a million times. We never question the Lord's compassion and presence when things are going well, but God's compassion isn't measured by our circumstances, nor is His kindness limited to our understanding. God cares just as much as when the storms are raging as when the seas are calm. His mercy is not limited to the shining sun or the stillness of the waves. So Jesus wakes up and he spoke three words. Peace, be still. And just like that, the storm ended. It's really encouraging that Jesus rebuked the storm and not the, not the terrified disciples. To them he simply said, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? There's a lesson in those words that we need to learn. The disciples were afraid because they were used to being in control of life. They knew how to handle hard situations. They weren't weak. They were tough men. And yet, when put in a life-threatening situation beyond their control, their faith turned to fear. Instead of putting them down, Jesus simply says, Have you still no faith? The answer is, well, yes and no. They had faith in Jesus. They truly believed in him. But their faith, though real, was not fully developed or fully grown. And so how do you get the faith that enables you to survive the storms of life? The only answer I know is to get in a boat with Jesus and ride with him wherever he wants to go. Even when it makes no sense to us, if he calls you, he will go with you. Sometimes we need to go through storms in order to discover our faith. We wish we didn't need to go through the storms. We wish they didn't exist. We wish we didn't have to go through hardships to grow and to mature and to discover more about ourselves in life. But the fact is, there are storms in life. Sometimes we create them. Sometimes others would create them. God knows about the storms all the time. No storms are a surprise to God. No storms are a surprise to God at all. Okay, and now that's why I want to take a break right here and you to repeat that. No storms are a surprise to God. No storms are a surprise to God. Okay? And the coronavirus is not a shock to God. He knew it was coming. Okay, so it is for all of us who follow Jesus. There are no shortcuts in the storms of life. The storms of life are not a detour. They are not a mistake. They are not a trick or a trap. They are not sent to destroy you. And so that you won't miss the point, I'm going to say it again. <clears throat> and I ask this question. Who told them to get in the boat in the first place? Jesus. It was his idea all along. Did he know about the storm in advance? Of course he did. And he told them to get in the boat anyways. Did he warn them in advance? No. Because that would have ruined the lesson they needed to learn. After all, if you knew you were going to enter a stormy time, would you really get in the boat? No way. All of us have moments. <clears throat> Most of us <clears throat> have many of them when we feel utterly alone, when we feel forgotten by God, when life crashes in around us. Even after we've tried to do all the right things in all the right ways, there are still times when we feel that God has an, He's given up and he's not, he's not helping someone else. He's not worried about us. There's no avoiding these moments of, of the utter despair. In those moments, we have a choice to make, though. Either we choose to believe that the Lord is not surprised and will use the storm for his own purposes and good, uh, and, and all good will ultimately come out of that storm, and that may mean we never know the good, but we trust that good will come. Or we choose to believe that the Lord has abandoned us. And we become bitter and distant from the Lord. I don't believe we can manipulate God into avoiding the storms or somehow making them suddenly disappear. If anything, this story is meant to teach us the opposite. Sometimes our path takes us into the storm. Sometimes we see the clouds gathering and know it's coming. More often the winds suddenly rise up and our life, which had been so smooth and so well planned, suddenly turns upside down and we begin to sink beneath those waves. So here are a couple of things that you need to remember. If you are with Jesus, the boat will never sink. If you are with Jesus, 
the storm will not last forever. And we seem to think that if we are Christians, we should have some type of exemption card. Kind of like a do not go to jail card in Monopoly. Bad things should not happen to us. And when they do, we're shocked. We're wondering, how could this happen? I paid my insurance. I went to church. I gave my money. I helped and I served. I've been kind to my neighbors. So why? Why is this happening to me? Isn't God supposed to watch out for me? Doesn't he protect those he loves? Yes, he is. It makes no sense at the moment, and maybe it will never make full sense. Yet we are called to trust in Jesus all the time. Trust that his plan is the perfect plan. His plan is better than our plan. And you think about, are you in a storm at this very moment? You're not there by accident. You're there by your father's design. He does not intend to hurt you, even though you feel like screaming because your pain is so great. You're not alone, though it may feel that way. You may have lost everything, but you have not lost the Lord. He is still with you. He promises never to fail you or abandon you. Here's the point. In the end, the disciples were filled with awe. It's a reverent awe in Jesus. Suddenly, and they've never seen it before, the wind and waves, nature is obeying Jesus. That's only something that God can do. They've been given a fresh revelation of the goodness and the greatness of God. He most certainly was with them in the storm, and he can rebuke the storm, and he can be with you at the very same time. Who is this Jesus? He's more than a teacher and a mentor and a leader. He's more than a friend. He's more than a healer. He's God. They didn't ask for the storm, and they certainly didn't enjoy that storm. They didn't really feel close to Jesus in the storm. It challenged them to the very core. But after Jesus stilled it, they came out of that storm with a fresh understanding of God, and they had a greater confidence. So fear not, and keep believing. Okay? The master of the sea is with you. Think about it. <clears throat> and what a Christ we serve. Even the winds and waves, they obey him. Trust that the Lord is with you. He is fighting for you. He is your redeemer. And you are his child. Holy and dearly loved and worth dying for. Know that Jesus is with you in the midst of the storms. The coronavirus didn't shock him. Your hardships and struggles are not too much for him. He's got this. But will you trust that all is well? And all will be well with your soul. Right now, let's take a moment... <clears throat> And we're going to ask Jesus for a cleansing. And we're going to do our prayer for salvation. So if you can bow your heads and repeat after me. But remember, uh, when you do this, you need to believe it in your heart. And, and <clears throat> be serious. So if you're ready, and here we go. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father... I know that I am a sinner. I am sorry for my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe in my heart that your son Jesus died on the cross. And on the third day, he has risen. Thank you for forgiving me and giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer with me and uh, you believed it in your heart, you are saved. And if you are already saved, this prayer is great for a refreshing. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel better when I ask for forgiveness because I know that he forgave me. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody that joined us. And remember to shoot me a message on Facebook. Let me know if you liked it, um, if you want to add something to it, what a new discussion would you like to have anything you'd like to talk about if you have a question you would like me to answer um, that I'll do next week um, just reach out to me uh, I know I'm not perfect and I don't expect to be perfect I just wanted to try to get some people together and um, break up the week and uh, don't want people to forget about Jesus I mean he is our all um before we close, though, I want to tell you another story. Um, a minister that decided that a visual demonstration would add emphasis to his Sunday uh, sermon, he took uh, four worms and he placed them into four separate jars. Well, the first worm was put into a container of alcohol, 
The second one was into a container of cigarette smoke. The third one was in a container of chocolate syrup. The fourth one was put into a container of good, clean soil. Well, at the conclusion of the sermon, the minister reported the following results. The first worm in alcohol was dead. The second worm in cigarette smoke was dead. The third worm in the chocolate syrup was dead. The fourth worm in the good, clean soil was alive. So the minister asked the congregation, What can you learn from this demonstration? Well, Nancy, she's sitting in the back. She quickly raised her hand and she said, as long as you drink, smoke, and eat chocolate, you won't have worms. So that pretty much ended the service. All right, everybody, you have a great bus week. Um, you can join us Sunday, uh, 11.30 a.m. Um, we go on Facebook Live, same place, Cup of Joe with Jesus, but we're going to have the Servants of God Tabernacle. And then um, that's every, again every Sunday, and then Wednesday is 7.30 Central Standard Time, Cup of Joe with Jesus. This was our first one, so any mistakes, I apologize. But uh, we're going to take each week and be a learning experience. And um, again, I thank you for joining us. Have a great blessed week. And um, before we go, remember Matthew 18, 20. <clears throat> for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So <clears throat> now that we got Jesus is here with us, let's do our last, last prayer, closing prayer. We can bow our head in prayer, please. Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you that we can live in your light and walk in your truth. May the things that you have revealed and thoughts that we have shared dwell in our hearts and stir us to action. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everybody.